Welcome everybody. Nice to see you here in the live stream. Good morning to all of my students who haven't heard me say that in a while because we've been out of school. Uh, I'm glad to see that you guys are here for the live stream. This is going to be uh, my hobby for a while, at least for the for the duration of the summertime. Uh, I found a whole bunch of really cool old movies to watch. Some of them are short, some of them are full length features. Uh, I'm, I'm planning out how I'm going to kind of tackle this for the for the foreseeable future for the summertime at least. Uh, so hopefully you guys are into that. And, and hopefully you find my commentary to be interesting. Uh, today, we're actually looking at some uh, a really cool uh, piece of film that I found from 1921. Uh, this comes from a whole series of, of international newsreels which uh, were produced by the Hearst Corporation, which was uh, owned by William Randolph Hearst, who's, who's legendary in the, the uh, news and, and print and, and film industry and, and everything else. He really started this in 1914. It was called the Hearst Metratone News. Uh, it continued all the way up until 1967. It was produced by the Hearst Corporation itself. In 1936, it changed its name to the uh, News of the Day. And, and what used to happen was when you went to the movies, you used to pay your money and you could go and you could stay all day and you could watch as many features as they were running. And then in between them, they would have what were called bumpers. And the bumpers Bumpers were essentially you'd have cartoons, you'd have news reels, you'd have all kinds of things just to just to keep people entertained so that they would stay longer. And the real money in it, and the real the real reason why they wanted to keep people there all day was so you kept going back and buying concessions because that's where the cinema or the theater really made most of its money was in concessions. So. The, what we're watching today is from 1921. Uh, it's hard to date it exactly. It's probably from the end of 1921 because of some of the things that, that uh, it depicts. Uh, it didn't happen until quite a bit later uh, in 1921. So um, eventually uh, th this came to be because William Randolph Hearst had some problems that, that people got relatively upset uh, with him. And so he... Um, he eventually changed uh, this over uh, from the, the Hearst newsreel to international newsreel, and eventually it became MGM News uh, when they took it over. Uh, from 1919 to 1929, international newsreel was produced by Hearst's uh, International News Service, and it was released by Universal Studios. So this is still something which is, which is actively, uh, it was actively out there and being produced all the way up until... Um, the 1960s. 1967 was the last time that this particular uh, set of newsreels was produced. So let's get started and let's uh, let's jump into international news number 442 from 1921. Um, and we'll take a look at all the cool goings on uh, from the early 1920s, from 1921. So here we go. This is silent, of course. Uh, talkies didn't really come out until the, the late 20s, really 1928. Uh, we didn't see talkies very very commonly, and something like this wouldn't have been a, a talkie anyhow. Um, this one's actually really cool. It, it's interesting that they started with this as well. Um, I, I think about this in terms of the, the kind of news service of it, and one of the really interesting things to me is that this news organization was basically just putting things out there to say, here's what happened period, right? There's not a whole lot of interpretation. It's really not what we're used to on the television news today, whether it's Fox News saying that everything's great from the Republican side and the the, the other news services saying that everything's great from the Democratic side. It, it's not that kind of interpretive sort of thing. It's just, here's what happened. Here's some shots of it so that you know, so that you can make up your own mind and really, you know, make up your mind about whether this was a good thing or a bad thing or, you know, it's, it's basically just news of what's going on. So we start off here in Terre Haute, Indiana with an organization called the Knights of Columbus. Uh, the Knights of Columbus is a Catholic fraternal organization. So it's a, an organization that gets together and does charity work and they, they hang out together. Um, and, and one of the things that they decided to do was in Terre Haute, Indiana, they decided to build what will eventually they will call the Father Pierre Gabalt home uh, for what they called uh, wayward boys. So one of the issues that they had was that you had a lot of children, young 
boys and young Catholic boys at the very beginning of this thing that really didn't have another place to go. And if they were dumped into an orphanage, they didn't often have really good uh, outcomes expected from that. And so the Knights of Columbus decided what they were going to do is they were going to build a home specifically for them. Now, they made this decision in 1909, that they were going to do this in 1909. Of course, in 1914, World War I started, and that kind of slowed down progress on the development of the boys' home, but it was eventually ready to be dedicated. And what we're going to watch here in the, in the newsreel is the dedication on October the 9th of 1921 in Terre Haute, Indiana, of the Father Pierre Gabalt Boys' Home. So I'm going to start the video up again, and we're going to start watching. Now, it is silent, so I can kind of talk over it. Uh, to, to give you some context. On October the 9th, 1921, over 20,000 people went to Terre Haute, Indiana uh, to, to celebrate the recognition of this dream that they had started in 1909 to, to get a boy's home, or again, a, they called it, and this is a quote directly from them, a refuge for wayward boys. The Knights of Columbus, uh, they'd spent years and years and years planning this, and ultimately they, they named it after Father Pierre Gabalt, who was a patriot priest during the, the American Revolution. Um, they bought the old Fred B. Smith estate, which was in Terre Haute, Indiana, and they dedicated it to uh, the this home for wayward boys. And you can see everybody in this film is, is you know, really nicely dressed up. They came from all over the country. The, I would assume that most of these people would be members of the Knights of Columbus. Um, Originally, this was started for boys only and, and for Catholic boys only. Today, actually, what's really cool about this is I was able to find out that the Father Gabalt House was is still actively taking care of and educating and giving you know young people today, not just Catholics and not just boys, but all kinds of people. We're looking here at the Reverend Francis T. Jansen um, and the Right Reverend uh, Joseph Chartrand, who are leading Mass. And again, most of these people are going to be Catholic because of the Knights of Columbus is Catholic. Uh, so I thought that that was really cool that it's a it's an organization which is still out there and still actively helping children today. Uh, here, this this is a weird one, and I again, it's it's strange that these things all got collected together, and I'm not really sure if they were collected together in this way by the Hearst Corporation or whether this was cut together later when they digitized it. But what we've got here is a state deputy named Joseph Nury who's showing off a baseball that he was given by Babe Ruth. Uh, and, and this was apparently such a big deal that people came out and filmed it. Uh, I presume... And this is just a presumption on my part, but I presume very heavily that he was running for office at this time. And so he's trying to make this association between himself and Babe Ruth to try to get himself elected uh, to, to office. But it just it seems like such a strange thing. Like, hey, look at me. I've got a Babe Ruth, Ruth baseball that Ruth gave me. Uh, and, and to the fact that it would be on an international news uh, broadcast is even weirder. Um, but he's really happy about it, right? He's... <laughs> It's great. I love it. All right. Now, this next segment is the this one needs a little bit of explanation because this took me some time to research, but this is really really cool because what we've got here is what they call the Big 4 in 1921. This is an association of politicians and politically minded people, people in government and people who had been in government for a really 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 long time. So America's Big 4 the four men that we're talking about here are first um, Elihu Root. Elihu Root was the 41st Secretary of War for both President McKinley and President Teddy Roosevelt from 1899 to 1904. So he was around as a Secretary of War for the Spanish-American War. And, and again, he oversaw the transformation of the modern American military. He also served as the 38th Secretary of State for Teddy Roosevelt from 1905 until 1909. So for 10 years, this guy was a major force. Uh, for those of you that, that know anything about the shooting sports and the, the development of Camp Perry, Ohio, Elihu Root was not only instrumental in the creation of that institution of the national matches, but also, of course, there's a there's a, a trophy named after him uh, in the national matches, specifically because he helped Teddy Roosevelt to set up the national matches. So first, we've got Elihu Root. Second, we've got Charles Hughes, who was the 11th Chief Justice of the United States eventually. Uh, he was the Chief Justice of the United States from 1930 to 1941. He was also the 44th Secretary of State under Presidents Harding and Coolidge from 1921 to 1924. 
generally when he was on the Supreme Court of the United States, it's really interesting. At the time, the court was actually very, very strikingly divided between what they called the liberal side and the conservative side, and they even had names for that. Um, the, the liberal side was called the Three Musketeers because they all generally voted together on the, to represent the liberal point of view. The, big, the, the four horsemen then were the conservative side of the Supreme Court, and Chief Justice Charles Hughes was generally considered to be the swing vote between the three musketeers and the four horsemen. So you want to talk about some kind of storied history there in terms of the American Supreme Court. Charles Hughes is a big, big, big deal as well. The third guy we've got in this big four from the United States is Henry Cabot Lodge. Henry Cabot Lodge is a legend in American political history for a couple of reasons. Number one, he was a senator from Massachusetts from 1893 until 1924. He was also considered to be a huge hawk. Uh, he he was uh, a guy who actually got into a direct conflict with President Woodrow Wilson, specifically over the League of Nations provision of the Treaty of Versailles. William Cabot Lodge did not want the League of Nations, and in the United States Senate, he was one of the leading voices to oppose the, ad the, the adoption of that. The last guy we've got, and so you'll notice that the first three, Elihu Root, Charles, uh, Hugh, uh, Charles Hughes, and Henry Cabot Lodge are all, are all three Republicans. We also then have a Democrat in in this particular group as well, and that would be Senate Minority Leader Oscar Underwood. He was the Senate Minority Leader, which represent, means he represented the Democratic Party in the Senate from 1920 until 1923. He was also a senator from the state of Alabama from 1915 until 1927. These four guys are humongous. This is just a powerhouse of people getting together. And so then the big question is, what in the heck are they getting together for? Well, it tells us they're here to supervise and oversee and to speak to uh, a group of postmasters. <laughs> Right? They're posing for the movies at a conference of postmasters. And eventually then, of course, what we're also going to see is the big dog himself, right? Here we've got the big four, right? The big four who we can see, Elihu Root, Senator Underwood, Secretary of State Hughes, and Henry Cabot Lodge, who was a senator at the time. Right? Again, giants in American political history. These guys, these guys really helped to shape 20. 20th century American politics uh, in a very, very large way. Right, so they're going to this International Conference of Postmasters. And then, of course, what we get is President and Mrs. Harding who show up to also talk to 2,000 different postmasters from all over the country. Now, this is rumored to be the very first time that Mrs. Harding was ever on film. And so you could see there that President Harding actually leaned over to her and nudged her and said, dear, we're being filmed. And so she kind of in this impromptu way came up with what I can only describe as the greatest gesture in the early history of film. <laughs> So there's Mrs. Harding giving the old fist bump kind of a thing. Now, there's an interesting story about her, too. The, the rumor is, and this is just rumor, but this is a rumor that you hear. Uh, the rumor is that Mrs. Uh, uh, President Harding was actually a womanizer and that he was very, very fond of his private secretary in the White House. And he also happened to have a dog. And the dog followed President Harding absolutely everywhere that he went. And one day, uh, Mrs. McKinley went into the, to the White House to find him, to his offices to find him, and she couldn't find him, and she couldn't find his secretary, but she did find the dog, and the dog was parked right outside of the closet in President McKinley's office. And so the, the story goes that she suspected that, that you know President Harding was having an affair with her, and she was also maybe potentially having an affair with the Surgeon General of the United States. And wouldn't you know it, it wasn't too much longer later that McKinley ended up dead. So uh, weird. Now here we've got some postmasters, right? Which is awesome. The, I mean, just, just look at these guys, right? The leaders of their postal, their postal services and their, you know, their parts of the country. These are, these are salt of the earth kinds of dudes excited to see President Harding. You can just tell. Right. Now, Next up, what we've got is Sir Harry Lauder. Now, Sir Harry Lauder is, he's another just giant of the first part of the 20th century. Uh, Sir Harry Lauder, and he at this time he was, in fact, Sir Harry Lauder. Uh, he was described by uh, Winston Churchill as being Scotland's greatest ever ambassador. And later on, he also wrote that Lauder uh, had, uh, by, inspiring, by inspiring songs and a valiant life, had rendered measureless service to the Scottish race and to the British Empire. 
In 1911, uh, he, he uh, Sir Lauder had been uh, the number one selling and highest paid performer in the entire world. He was, was also the first British artist ever to sell one million records. In 1928, he actually sold two million records. So he was a big deal. And he really popularized things, especially in the United States, like the kilt and Scottish music and, and thing, you know, just Scottish things like that in general, tartan patterns and things like that. During World War One and immediately after World War One, uh, he was, he was, uh, well known for going around and entertaining troops during the First World War and after the First World War. Uh, for that, he was knighted in 1919. In addition to helping raise lots and lots of money for the war effort, he was knighted in 1919. Then he later kind of went into semi-retirement in the 1930s. And eventually, even in World War II, he came back to entertain, entertain the troops. So here we've got Harry Lauder, Sir Harry Lauder, going to Sing Sing Prison in New York State to visit and to go on an you know, international tour and to see what's going on. Uh, so here you can see him in his kilt and his tam hat, carrying his walking stick with the tall socks, uh, smoking a pipe, of course. But uh, the, the big thing you got to remember about that is it's not good for your dental work. Uh, oof, not, not great teeth on him uh, so much. Okay, next up we've got something that isn't fun so much as it is interesting. Uh, this is this is also going to be from October of 1921, and this one's actually about the, the the second iteration of the Ku Klux Klan. the The Ku Klux Klan originally started after the Civil War to try to repress the growing power of newly freed Black people in the South. Right, the, the slaves had been freed as a result of the Civil War, and so white Southern Democrat uh, landowners wanted to try to prevent them from having a huge amount of influence over how the South was going to work. And so that started this kind of campaign of violence and and the the the, the first iteration of the Ku Klux Klan. But eventually that went away. They, they were suppressed. They, they lost interest. It was, it was kind of over and done with. It wasn't until 1915 that the Ku Klux Klan came back as a result of a guy named William J. Simmons. Now, Simmons was the founder of the second Ku Klux Klan. He actually founded it on Thanksgiving Day in 1915, and he also then became the first leader of this newly rejuvenated Ku Klux Klan. Simmons and his friends, actually, two of which were, were older fellows that had been members of the original Ku Klux Klan. And let me right now state for all the guys that are going to come into my comment section and talk about how I'm a, a Nazi and I'm a Klan member and this and that. No, I, I am not a supporter of the Ku Klux Klan. I found this on this newsreel. I did some research. This is just to inform people because I thought it was interesting. And, and again, we'll, we'll see how, kind of what, you know, how this comes out in the, in the film itself. But no, I'm not a supporter of hate groups. No, I'm not a supporter of the Klan. I just thought this was an interesting kind of story put together in this this interesting collection of stuff on this on this film. Uh, but on Thanksgiving night, in 1915, William J. Simmons, as well as uh, a couple of other people, two of which had been members of the original Klan, climbed up Stone Mountain to burn a cross as the inauguration of the recreation of this new Ku Klux Klan and 15 charter members. Now, what's really really interesting about that is. The burning of the cross imagery was not part, neither were the white gowns and the hoods and all that kind of stuff. None of that was a part of the original Ku Klux Klan. Those two images in particular, the white cloaks with the white masks and then the burning of the cross thing, all of that stuff came from the 1905 film by D.W. Griffith called Birth of a Nation. All of that stuff came from Birth of a Nation and they then instituted that and said, this is what we're going to do. And this is how we're going to continue with this second rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan is we're going to do what D.W. Griffith showed us in Birth of a Nation. And we're going to wear the white robes and the white masks. And we're going to burn crosses and all that stuff. Whereas none of that stuff had actually been part of the original Ku Klux Klan. It was part of the second Ku Klux Klan. And it came from this, this infamous film, which actually I'm kind of thinking that maybe one time, you know, at some point in the future, I might actually do Birth of a Nation for one of these response videos. But that's where a lot of that image of what we now think of as the modern Ku Klux Klan came from is that on Thanksgiving Day, this guy started a hate group that was opposed to Jews and Roman Catholics and, and anybody else who wasn't you know a white Anglo-Saxon uh, Protestant. When he created the new clan, then he also named himself to be the first imperial wizard of the invisible empire of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. 
They then started to reinforce Jim Crow laws. They started to do tremendous violence to black people, particularly in the South. But the big thing about the second Ku Klux Klan was it also spread and enjoyed quite a large amount of support in the industrialized Midwest. And the reason for that is after Reconstruction in, in the 1870s, a lot of black Americans from the South moved to the industrial Midwest because there were jobs there for them. And since they just recently got to own themselves because they've been freed slaves, they didn't have the opportunity to continue to farm in the South, and so they moved to the industrial Midwest. And that influx, that great migration of, of American blacks from the South into the Midwest caused a huge social kind of backlash to it. And so in the industrial Midwest, we do we did see that the second Ku Klux Klan did enjoy actually quite a lot of uh, support. And so one of the things was by 1921, by October of 1921, the House Committee on Rules decided we're going to do some investigation, right? We're six years into the creation of, well, almost six years, right? Because November of 1915 was its creation. Now we're into October of 1921 and the, the Congress is starting to get these concerns about, you know, are these people really dangerous? Are they really something we should worry about? Is this something we should do something about? Or are they just kind of a pain in the butt and we should mostly ignore them? And so what they did was they had an entire series of congressional hearings on this and William J. Simmons himself, the imperial wizard, went and testified in front of this House Rules Committee. And so that's what we're going to see here is him in the House Rules Committee. He's down there at the end. He's got very small round glasses and he's testifying as to what these guys are up to. You can see him there writing things out. Um, now, the next one, I don't know why they put this in here. I have no idea at all why this is in here, but it's a puppy coming out of a mailbox on the grass, um, which is awesome. I love it. I have no idea why the Hearst News Agency decided to include it in this particular film, but awesome. That's really great. It really entertains me to no end. Okay, now next up, what we're going to see is the 1921 Major League Baseball Championship New York Giants team. And in addition, we're going to see, of course, probably, well, their second most famous member of the time after Babe Ruth. Um, their manager was a big deal. And here's their manager. His name was Fightin' John McGraw. Sometimes they referred to him as Little Napoleon. He was also had the nickname of Muggsy. And the reason for that was his attitude. So John McGraw was born John Joseph McGraw. He was originally a third baseman at the beginning of his career. Later on, he played shortstop as well as he played in the outfield in the major leagues, in Major League Baseball in the United States. In 1937, he was elected to the, to the Baseball Hall of Fame. So we're talking about a big deal here. This guy's a big deal. He was really, really well thought of as a player, but act, and, and actually he became kind of almost synonymous with what they call the dead ball era of baseball, which is the era of baseball just before Babe Ruth started the kind of slugger era of baseball. John McGraw was a big deal. Um, and he was really well known for two things. Number one, he had a really, really, really bad temper. And number two, he was very well known for bending the rules. Now, what's really awesome about him is he was key in the Baltimore Orioles 1890s winning streak where, where they continued to win year after year after year. They continued to win the pennant year after year after year. And, and he was you know in a major league responsible for that. But what's even more important about him is after his playing career, he started to become what they called a captain manager or a playing manager, which means he was the on-field manager that actually directly managed uh, his teams starting uh, in 1902 with the New York, Gi he started with the New York Giants rather in 1902. Um, and, and he became even more famous and even more important, even though he'd been a great player, he'd been become even more famous and more important as a baseball manager um, for, for a couple of different reasons. Number one reason is McGraw held the Major League Baseball record for the most ejections from a game by any manager up until the year 2002, he was ejected from Major League Baseball games 132 times, and that record was only broken by Bobby Cox in 2007. 
Beyond that then, he also had a total of 2,764 victories, and that is second still to this day, that is at least in terms of 2020, second to this day behind only Connie Mack, and he still holds the National League record for his National League record wins, which is 2,669 wins. According to his BaseballLibrary.com profile, McGraw is widely held to be, quote, the best player to become a great manager, end quote, in the history of baseball, right? So you're talking about this guy's a legend, you know, still to this day, you know, he still has records in the National League. Like, that's really awesome. And there he is. Looks like a nice guy, you know, from his from his film, but who knows? Apparently, he had a heck of a temper. Next up, what we've got is the mayor of New York City, John F. Hyland. Uh, he is unveiling a bust of Christopher Columbus at a ceremony uh, in 1921. Uh, William, uh, I'm sorry, John Hyland was the 96th mayor of New York City from 1918 until 1925. He was a Democrat. Uh, later, he was appointed a judge, and he's actually a major figure in New York City for the progressive era. He was, he was super against big business and the industrialization processes that was going on. Next up, we've got another big one, and this one's from international sports as well. Um, what we've got is uh, the, the schooner, Elsie, has just won the contest to represent the United States in what's called the Halifax race in this particular title card. But in fact, what they're talking about is what we refer to now, and this is something which is actually still around to this day, uh, is called the Marblehead to Halifax Ocean Race, or the M-H-O-R, right, the Moore race is sometimes how they how they refer to this. It's a biennial, which means every other year, sailing race, uh, which in, in 2005 actually had its hundredth running. So again, this thing is still around. It's still going on today. Uh, the, the sailing race actually is Canada versus the United States, one representative from Canada, one representative from the United States, and there are contests beforehand to, to have the honor of actually representing your country in the, the Marblehead to Halifax Ocean race. Um, as of right now, this is still considered to be the the uh, longest running offshore ocean race in the world, and and it's still considered you know held in very very high regard uh, for for the people who are still running it to this day. So what we've got here is uh, for the Halifax race in 2001, the schooner Elsie, which was going to be captained by Marty Welsh. Um, is going to be shown here sailing off of Gloucester, Massachusetts. Now, the 1921 race was actually a really big deal. Here you can see the Hanks. They actually forgot the Hank on the very top of the sail there, so that's not going to help them all that much. There, Maybe they have it hanged to the wrong stay, but I don't know. Uh, in any event, uh, the 1921 race is actually notorious for a couple of reasons. The number one reason that it's notorious is, according to R. Keither McLaren in his book, A Race for Real Sailors, uh, he described this particular race as causing, grum quote, grumbling from the New York papers out of the differences between the two vessels involved. Uh, end quote. The American Elsie was said to be, quote, built solely for as a deep sea fisherman, end quote, whereas the Canadian representative, which was called the Blue Nose, was, quote, much larger than the Gloucester boat, which is the Elsie, uh, with a longer water line and much more sail and had been specifically designed to win this race. So when we see the Elsie, again, this is, a, this is a fishing ship. This is something which was not specifically designed to win a race, whereas the Blue Nose, at least according to New York newspapers, was being accused of basically cheating because they said it was designed specifically to win the Marblehead to Halifax Ocean Race in 1921. And that's just really awesome. <laughs> okay, now we move back into something which is a little bit heavier, uh, and and definitely something you know uh, uh, noteworthy, but not quite so kind of fluffy as is that other stuff. And again, it's really important to recognize that because these were bumpers between feature films in in uh, theaters, they had to keep things entertained, keep people entertained and keep things entertaining and, you know, have some variety there to keep people sitting in the theaters all day so that they would go and buy more popcorn and, you know, Coca-Cola and, and things like that. So the next piece of international news that we've got is uh, graphic pictures of the Great Famine in the Soviet Union from 1921. Uh, this is this was actually filmed in the region of Kasan and shows uh, you know starving children and mothers and, and things like that. So let's let's jump into some of the background that I'll, that I'll give you while this thing is playing. Um, the Great Soviet or the Great Russian Famine of 1921 to 22 is also called, and I'm going to try this. Uh, 
Povazaya famine. Uh, it was a severe famine caused inside of the Russian Federal Soviet Socialist Republic. It began in the spring of 1921. It lasted all the way in through 1922, and it really had two reasons for it to be so significant and so severe. One was Russia experienced a series of droughts in 1921, and on top of that, we also had the Russian Civil War between the Red Russians, the Bolsheviks, the communists, who were at the same time continuously fighting against the white Russians. Now, the problem with the white Russians, of course, was they were a disparate group of people, and the only thing they really all agreed on was they didn't like the, the communists. Because there was a civil war, and because especially the trains had been disrupted, both because just of the war itself and also because of an engineered famine, which mostly struck the Ukraine, but but this is still part of that. Uh, because of that, what we see is that people actually started to get to the point where they were so desperate that they started to eat seed grain rather than planting it for crops. And so what that did is it caused a cascading famine effect where the seeds got eaten instead of planted. When it got plant, you know, eaten instead of planted, ultimately the consequence of that was you didn't have food in the fall. The United States, uh, uh, the American Relief Administration, rather, actually stepped into the middle of this and donated both food and medicine that was estimated to have saved about 11 million people inside of Soviet Russia. However, despite those efforts, in the Ural and Volga regions, what we saw is as a result of this famine, about 5 million people just flat out starved to death, both, again, because of the famine, the civil war, which made it worse, and then all of this kind of misery that piled up on top of each other right in the middle of the Russian civil war. Uh, so again, the, the scenes that we're seeing here, you know, starvation and, you know, just, just horrible, awful, terrible living conditions, um, you know, it's, it's something to... to Keep in mind that, again, this is only 100 years ago, and yet this is the kind of thing that, that was going on during the Russian Civil War. It's one of the reasons why the Civil War was so, was so devastating to Russia, both in terms of just the, the grain failures in general... But of course, then you have people like Joseph Stalin, who are actively trying to discourage the distribution of food among people who are seen as at least supporters of the white Russian movement. Uh, so again, this it's, it's really interesting and cool footage, even though it's a really horrible and sad event. Right here we see food distribution. This is something very common in the rest of the world today. If you go to the third world, if you go to the slums in India or China, um, you know, sub-Saharan African countries, this is very typical. If you go and you know try to provide them with things, uh, you know, ultimately you, you see these kinds of swarms or mobs of people who are who are desperate and and trying not to die. Um, Right. But then, of course, the United States steps in and, and assists with this uh, relief elf effort through the American Relief Administration um, to, to hopefully save people. And again, the estimates are that as a result of those American supplies going in, and remember, this is right after World War I, like the world's already been devastated by the First World War. This is only 1921. And, and despite the fact that it was you know only 1921, the United States still steps in and provides assistance and relief for, again, the estimates are about 11 million people were saved as a result of the American Relief Administration stepping in with medicine, stepping in with food uh, to, to try to alleviate that suffering, at least to, to some extent. But, but still, despite our best efforts, 5 million people just outright starving to death. And again, you can see behind there, um, Right. Red Cross was there. Lots of people, uh, you know, did chip into this effort. But again, it was hampered by the fact that there was a civil war going on. So particularly, especially back then, what you saw was a, a lot of relief efforts were being targeted directly at children. Um, at about the same time that this is going on, we, we saw international efforts as well uh, being dedicated and devoted, particularly to the Armenian children. Uh, who were being subjected to the Armenian genocide by the Turkish government, the new, the new nationalist Turkish government. 
you know, international aid and international relief after the first world war, it's just, there's, there's a lot of aid work that needs to be done. Um, and again, you can see here, right? The first real nourishment in months. It's, uh, you know, Kellogg is there and, and trying desperately to feed these people and just keep them alive. But, you know, this, this is not something that we would associate with Europe uh, now in the 21st century. Um, so I'm going to see if I can find the truth about Russia. That, that sounds like it's a cool one. Uh, so far, I haven't had any luck finding that, but, but I would really love to get my hands on uh, the truth about Russia uh, from, from their future uh, international news stuff. So, so we'll see if I have any luck doing that. Okay, so the last segment on this international news newsreel is also really cool because it's got a lot of different kinds of things going on in it, although they're all generally you know, associated with the same kind of a thing. So we're, we're showing showing here in this particular newsreel, General Pershing. Okay, so let's talk first about General Pershing, because General Pershing's an interesting guy. His nickname was Blackjack Pershing, and everybody thinks that's a cool name, except for the fact that he didn't get it for anything cool. Uh, General Pershing was actually put in charge of an entire company of black soldiers, and the other officers in the military actually derided him for having been, having led black soldiers, and so they referred to him as Black Jack, because of course, you know, John Joseph Pershing, they did call him Jack, but Black Jack, that part was actually supposed to kind of cast him down because of his assignment to lead a, a group of black soldiers. Um, but General Pershing, of course, was the, the, the allied commander of the American forces in, the, in World War I. He oversaw the entire American military effort in World War I. And um, so here we are in 1921, after the war is technically over, and he is going to France, and later we'll see he, he's going to go to Germany, and he's going to lay a Congressional Medal of Honor on the Poilu's grave. So the Poilu is right next to the Arc of Triumph, the Arc de Triomphe, in Paris, and it's basically the Tomb of the Unknowns for French soldiers. Poilu, or Poilu, or, or Poilly, Poilly, I think is, is, or Poilu, I think is actually how the French would pronounce it, uh, or Poilly, maybe is how the French would pronounce it, but Poilu is 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 how the Americans pronounce it. So there's General uh, Pershing pinning a, a Congressional Medal of Honor onto the tomb of the Poilu. Um, now Poilu is a is a French a term for French soldiers in World War One, and it's actually kind of funny because it actually le it literally translates from French as the hairy one. Um, it's actually still a term. So you, so you, you hear these right. You hear about uh, you know American soldiers being called doughboys and British soldiers being called Tommies and, and and that sort of kind of you know nomenclature for for brothers in arms. Well, Poilu, the hairy one, is a term that was that was used for French infantrymen in the First World War, uh, and, and so it kind of carries this sort of uh, sense of of the kind of rustic nature of these <laughs> these these French soldiers uh, and their agricultural backgrounds. Right, generally these guys were associated with very large beards and often very well overgrown mustaches, mustaches even for the 19 teens, right? The World War One era. And, and the biggest thing that they were always associated with was French soldiers, infantrymen in the First World War were actually issued uh, a, a ration of very, very, very cheaply made wine. And so that was kind of something that was always associated with the Poilu uh, during World War I. General Pershing here, of course, is laying a Congressional Medal of Honor onto them, honoring all of the unknown soldiers from the First World War from France. Um, beyond that, what's really interesting about this is, of course, the, the war itself ends in 19... Uh, well, 18 is when the shooting stops. Uh, the, the Treaty of Versailles was seven months later, of course, on June the 28th of 1919. But you have to remember, and this actually takes us back to some previous stuff that we saw in this newsreel, uh, because of people like Henry Cabot Lodge, who was fighting President Wilson over the uh, Treaty of Paris, uh, we actually did not sign that Treaty of Paris. And so the, the state of war, even though we weren't fighting, the state of war actually did continue all the way up until the United States Senate and the House of Representatives passed what was called the Knox Porter Resolution, which was signed on July the 2nd of 1921 by President Warren Harding. So the thing you got to remember about this is we had only just officially ended the war against Germany. So from France, of course, President, uh, I'm sorry, General Pershing goes across the river and goes to Koblenz to review the troops. And um, we saw an American military processional through uh, Paris. Here, uh, General uh 
Pershing is meeting the Allied commanders on the Rhine River, and he's reviewing American soldiers as they're going by in formation just to, you know, just to inspect his troops and to see what the kind of status is of the occupation uh, at the very, very tail end of World War One. There they are carrying their 1903 Springfield rifles with those gigantic bayonets. The Doughboys. Lines aren't very straight for you band folks. There's General Pershing on top of his horse. Got some cavalrymen. Awesome stuff. All right, so that's the end of the film itself. I, I hope that you liked that. I know it was a lot of different variety. I know we were kind of all over the place, but that's kind of the nature of the film. Uh, I do have other projects coming up that I'm going to start working on. I've got some feature length films, some some you know full length movies uh, from from quite a long time ago. I've got some government stuff uh, that I can that I can use to produce these. Hopefully you're interested. If you are, again, please leave a like. Share this with somebody else that you think would get a kick out of it. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, check out my Twitter profile that I just set up for this channel. You can also check me out on Facebook and Patreon if you're really crazy and want to support me in doing all of this kind of stuff uh, through those particular means. So I really appreciate everybody who showed, showed up. I, I really appreciate everything that you guys are doing to support the channel. And uh, I will see you in the next one. I hope you liked it. Stay healthy and stay Stay safe, everybody, and uh, I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.